welcome to this ground up from machines to vehicles structures to buildings roads to bridges the fundamental physical facilities and systems serving a nation is manufactured at a great expense now when the infrastructure ages or the rapidly changing fundamentals of technology makes the infrastructure obsolete it needs to be either repaired or replaced justifiably the decision to replace the infrastructure needs to be made now this decision is not as simple as it seems the reason is as the infrastructure gets outdated it costs both the government and private industry millions in repairs or repairs or replacement it also creates business interruption supply chain risk and many more complex security risk now there are reports that by 2020 the aging and unreliable infrastructure in united states alone will cost american businesses 1.2 trillion dollars so imagine what would be the cost for fixing aging and unreliable infrastructure for all nations understandably replacing physical infrastructure at any level local national or global is going to be a very costly affair while there are ways to transfer and mitigate the infrastructure security risk there is a growing concern that the traditional insurance model will not be enough we need a more transparent and accountable way to manage the aging infrastructure security risk since this is by no means a simple affair it is important to understand and evaluate how best to transfer and manage the aging infrastructure risk it seems that risk modeling coupled with distributed ledger technology can detect measure and recover infrastructure obsolescence and maintenance risk to discuss blockchain based insurance model for managing aging infrastructure risk i'm delighted to welcome thomas wendling from jacobs engineering to risk roundup thomas serves on the board of advisors of the integrated energy blockchain consortium an organization that fosters engineering applications of distributed ledger technology he has years of industry experience and has in the past served on the program committee of the enterprise risk management symposium which provides thought leadership and best practices in risk management for the insurance and banking industries he has been a frequent speaker on strategic risk and the future of money welcome thomas we are delighted to have you on risk roundup Thank you very much Jay Shree. Thank you for that introduction. And I think you really hit right on the subject very accurately. And um yes, yeah, so I I do uh I am a systems engineer at Jacobs Engineering and I've been very much involved uh with the actuarial profession and especially on the property and casualty side over the last 10 years. And um you mentioned infrastructure, you mentioned assets, you mentioned uh when to replace assets. and it's um it, it's actually a, a an interesting application and i want to put it in a broad context i'm glad you mentioned some of the numbers that run into the trillions um but when you think about it all of our physical assets all of our stuff that surrounds us uh trains planes highways millions of miles of underground piping and uh fiber optic cable this is the the infrastructure that lets society thrive it's it's what we actually build ourselves on and without all of that uh we would basically be neanderthals <laughs> and um i i think that um it's also important to remember that our infrastructure is really it through its creation and through its operation is what consumes almost all of our scarce resources our energy our materials our labor and uh, there's so much concern about how to use those resources efficiently and how to leverage those resources to to increase our productivity in our global economy which has been decreasing at least the rate of growth has been decreasing for the last 40 years and it is surprisingly a risk management idea yes so many problems absolutely. absolutely you know you are you are absolutely right about that but before we go into talking about the risk management and the uh, what options do we have let's talk about the current state of our infrastructure for united states of course you know obviously so across uh, i mean it's not just the united states but also across many nations much of the critical infrastructure today in not only the geospace here but in cyberspace and space 
they are all either aging or becoming obsolete due to the rapidly changing technology fundamentals. So what is the state of United States infrastructure today from your assessment in cyberspace, geospace and space? Well, you hear a lot of articles about how our infrastructure is crumbling, and uh, there's a lot of truth to that. However, when you come to the United States after having visited, uh, for example, Venezuela, which is a, com a country where I, I worked a lot, uh, you have to admit that infrastructure is well maintained and replaced at a far more rational interval here in the United States than in, in many parts of the world. Uh, nevertheless, we have the same problems here as we do in, in Venezuela and other parts of the world, just to give a country as an example, in that we can never seem to rationally decide when to replace a, a major asset, uh, something like a gas turbine or, or a bridge. And because of that, we, uh, we run into potential uh, risk situation of catastrophic failure and loss of life. And uh, that's a big concern, and that's usually the, only the threat of that concern that really motivates people to, to keep up aging infrastructure, which is a shame because there are many opportunities to optimize the mortality and obsolescence of infrastructure using risk management principles, hard quantitative actuarial principles to, to replace, to, to synchronize the mortality of assets and to, to keep the maintenance up to date. Uh, that actually result in quantifiable efficiencies. You can actually recover resources quantifiably from our existing infrastructure which, without even having to get into the catastrophic dimension of it. So risk management at a much more um, actuarial level to actually deal with uh, proper timing of recognition of obsolescence of assets can already save and recover huge, uh, huge amounts of resources that would be otherwise wasted before even having to consider the catastrophic dimension, um, which tragically is what is the only thing that motivates us to keep up our infrastructure. Yes, absolutely. And that's an excellent point that you made there. So irrespective of nations, like you give example of Venezuela and even United States, or you look at any other nation, infrastructure provides the foundation of economy and quality of life. So since investing in aging infrastructure is essential, to supporting healthy and vibrant communities. How are nations currently managing the aging infrastructure risks? What is their process? What are they, how are they uh, evaluating the risk? How are they managing the risk? How are they looking at the whole infrastructure security? Well, it's, um, let, let's take a step back and, and look at what obsolescence actually is. Uh, there is no standard definition throughout industry of what it means to retire a bridge or to retire a vehicle or, or uh, uh, a light rain, a train car. There's no standard accepted definition for the mortality of these pieces of physical assets. Um, they have no vital signs. They have no heartbeat or breathing to measure. It, there's no exact moment of mortality of, of uh, an airplane or a jet engine. And the way you can define it is, uh, and this is something that I presented at, uh, to the, uh, the property and casualty field here in the U.S., uh, the Casualty Actuarial Society, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, tried to start this concept called uh, enterprise risk management, which is a very familiar term to us uh, in, the, in the risk practitioner field. But I think that the actuaries in the United States, in the PNC field, we're trying to create a broader definition to, to recognize uh, that their toolkit, their mathematical approach towards uh, liability, towards casualty, towards property could actually be used to define this concept of obsolescence of physical assets. Um, you see, unlike life tables in life insurance, you don't have such tables for physical assets. Uh, but at the same time, if I look out my back window here, I would have to stare at the road for a very long time before I see a 1979 Ford Pinto drive by <laughs> because they have all died. There are no Ford Pintos anymore. There are no AMC Pacers. The same thing happens in industry and in public transportation, in water supply, in communication. All the assets that have been installed over the decades, they go through a mortality cycle. And uh, by synchronizing the natural mortality, so with, with a, a more updated definition of what obsolescence is, 
you'll find that we'll be retiring, we'll be replacing things much more frequently than we are now. Because to answer your question, to get back to, I'm diverging a little bit, how do people manage it today? For the most part, they look at an asset and they think, oh, how many years can I defer replacing this asset? And, and of course, we get closer and closer into the danger zone. There are certain industries where you just cannot do that. You can't keep an airliner for 50 years when you know, its, it's natural life is maybe closer to 20. It becomes obsolete simply because of safety reasons. But in other industries, you'll find a lot of heavy equipment in, in, um, in again, public water supply, in, uh, uh, in, in just you know, transportation, communications infrastructure, that the policy for most governments, most industries, is simply to keep deferring the replacement of something as long as they can. Nobody wants to create the huge cash drain on replacing a major piece of equipment. They don't want to do that on their watch. So our whole management um, uh, accounting systems, our whole incentive systems, our whole short-term vision um, is not compatible for legacy infrastructure. The short-term vision of quarterly earnings calls is just not compatible for managing assets that live 20, 30, 50 years. Um, That's very right. Say because, you know, you, from what you are saying, that there is not a single organization uh, that provides that. There is some echo. Are you hearing? Are you hearing? It was there for a second, but it's gone now. So there is no organization, it seems, that provides guidelines, nor there are regulations, nor there are any, uh, you know, there is any audits or there are no, there is no accountability. I mean, people can, uh, entities can keep on their infrastructure as long as they can. That is a real cause of concern. But so irrespective of whether this is a transportation network or communication network or energy grid or water system, it seems nations today faces complex security risks due to this current state of their infrastructure. So uh, when we don't have all these necessary organizations that can keep uh, a check on the state of the infrastructure, the, a lot of security risk will emerge from these aging infrastructure deficiencies. So what security risk uh, do you see emerging because of this uh, lack of all these uh, uh, pieces of uh, foundation that we need that are not uh, existing across nations? Well, um, it's not as much a security risk. Uh, when we think of risk management, we do tend to think more in terms of uh, uh, catastrophic things, or we think of insolvencies or black swans. We think of really big things that have uh, that are very infrequent. And yes, there's no question about it. Crumbling infrastructure does present a risk to uh, uh, to life. Uh, you wouldn't want to be driving down the bridge that uh, that begins to resonate in the wind and then crumbles. And and it's uh, it's something that, uh, without a doubt, without a question, you can't have airliners uh, flying around with cracks in the wings, and that that is a big big concern. And I think that when it comes to safety, each industry has its best practices, and I think they cover that fairly well. Um, but the other side of insurance that I'm more interested in and that I think is, is kind of underappreciated uh, is the, the handling of the, the routine mundane kinds of risks that when they are aggregated together, reveal patterns that you can exploit to, to extract enormous efficiencies that we are simply not aware of because we don't have the accounting tools in place or the systems to even observe them. But theoretically, they do exist. They're there. And this is where insurance comes in. And you were talking about not international, global standards uh, for, for sharing information about infrastructure, like insurance does. The systems of insurance, and this ties back also into the uh, the, uh, the time horizon that I was talking about, infrastructure has a very long time horizon, uh, yet most business models, most companies are driven, again, by quarterly earnings calls, and they look at everything in a short, short term, whereas insurance went through a painful epoch of uh, insolvencies because they were also structured initially to look in the short term. Um, uh, fire insurance and against fire damage, property damage, and even uh, then, especially later workers' compensation, which had a much longer tailed exposure to to claims, uh, were being inappropriately handed by, handled by companies that had this short vision until regulation stepped in and provided a healthy 
requirement to look at the long horizon, to keep reserves on a balance sheet, which reserves are liabilities, of course, which you have to match with assets in an insurance company. And their whole way of financial reporting too is long-term. Things like asbestos and environmental claims, you have to have sometimes 20, 30 year horizons to look at that. Um, most liability claims are not that long. They're maybe five to seven years. But infrastructure, you can think of it as a liability because one day you're going to have to replace, especially if you're a municipality or a city that's ostensibly going to be there for a very, very long time. You should look at these things as liabilities on your balance sheet and and understand that, um, and this is where I'm going to become an engineer on you for just a second. All of that infrastructure uses uh, uh, energy. It uses labor. It uses materials to keep it running. And there is a very important balancing act that you can achieve between the capital expenditure and the operating expenditures that can be balanced through insurance-like approaches, through actuarial approaches, through the law of large numbers, the insurance principle. And maybe it's not as glamorous as black swans and insolvencies and catastrophic loss of life. I mean, that's what we think of when we think of risk most of the time. But the actuaries, I think, have something very important to contribute to aggregating these, these uh, mundane high frequency risks that we don't think of so much as risks, but that can extract enormous value out of the hundred trillion dollars of infrastructure that exists in the world today. It can be optimized. Sure, uh, but Thomas, let's do this. Let's talk about, we will get to that, uh, this uh, new approach, the unique approach and model that you are proposing. But let's talk about the current state of how the industry is managing, uh, what are the different ways the industry is managing this risk and what is the process of determining what is at risk, like how vulnerable is the infrastructure or when was it built and uh, how likely it is going to fail? Is, is there a qualitative or quantitative analysis that can uh, analysis that can help determine the probability of failure? These kind of uh, uh, different questions, different uh, variables that needs to be concerned. How is the industry doing it uh, at the moment? Right. And okay. then we can talk about this new unique model that you are talking about. There is a very well-developed field called reliability engineering, and I'm sure you've heard of it. And reliability engineering is very well developed. It's, uh, it, it can analyze systems for vulnerabilities, uh, lack of redundancy, uh, critical systems, and it really tries in a very quantitative way to, to address the, the probability of failures and downtime. Um, availability of equipment, and then what are the downstream effects uh, of, of a failure of a major piece of equipment. And um, there are insurance products actually that address um, uh, boiler mechanical insurance uh, are sometimes for certain types of businesses are very important. If there's a power failure and part of the facility doesn't work, uh, what are the revenues that they have lost because of that over a 24-hour period, for example? And there are insurance products that already address that. And um, it, it's a slightly different concept, though, from the, the mathematical theory that you're inviting me to speak about in, further along the, the agenda. But um, that would probably be the best answer I could give you right now, that reliability engineering is the discipline that actually studies the, the risk of failure, the risk of downtime, the financial consequences, the, uh, um, the, the mission critical consequences in a system. And it's actually a very, very uh, mathematical discipline. It's, uh, I believe it's a branch or uh, sort of a, an overlap between mechanical engineering and uh, industrial engineering. And they have their own uh, experts in that field. Good, I'm glad to hear that. Now the risk of an aging infrastructure uh, includes so many different traditional exposures of uh, many different kinds of risk and uh, also involves the business resiliency challenges and the systemic risk that arise because of the interconnected nature of the infrastructure there. Everything is interconnected and interdependent. So while the risk and challenges of all these pose, posed by the aging infrastructure 
are significant. It seems that there is a real opportunity here, as you were just discussing about for the insurance industry to become part of the solution. So what role can insurance industry play in managing aging infrastructure risk? We know that insure, we have been using insurance for transferring risk uh, in, across you know, industries and across uh, different uh, kinds of uh, and nature of risk. But here for the aging infrastructure, what role do you see insurance industry playing in the ma managing the aging infrastructure risk? I think yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, insurance has tried, again, through this initiative in the Casualty Actuarial Society and the Society of Actuaries as well, and, and other actuarial professions have, have really tried to move their skill set into this type of thing because they know that they have a lot to offer. Um, and it's kind of it's kind of fallen flat the effort, and they've kind of reverted back to defining risk management as in the context in the limited context of uh, managing uh, solvency and risk of insolvency of insurance companies, which is very important. Um, I think that the insurance company certainly has the talent and the, the just the institutions. I mean, the whole reinsurance industry, uh, the actuarial profession, the underwriting profession, all of this could be retooled to address many phenomena in society that can be optimized through the thing that the, the basic um, mathematical principle of insurance, which is the law of large numbers. But I think the reason that the whole thing is stagnated isn't because of the failure of will on the part of those who wanted to do this. It's simply the lack of data. Insurance products can structure around where there is data. There are life tables, and there always have been uh, for, for life insurance products, simply because that data actually gets collected. It's the vital statistics that any government will collect on its citizens. It's easy to collect information on existing um, insurance products, such as uh, liability insurance of various kinds. Yeah, commercial general liability, for example, are several coverages grouped together. And there is, uh, there, there is actual loss experience that can be aggregated and studied. And it moves around. It migrates uh, as a function of changes in legislation and things. But insurance creating totally new products that address theoretical ideas of what's going on in society, things like supply chain management at a totally different level that's currently being exercised by, by Amazon, for example, or by UPS. Uh, insurance could have this, this, this very high level view of things that they could aggregate. They've got, like I said, the institutions, the third party institutions, the insurance company, the reinsurance industry, they could handle this perfectly. The problem is that data does not exist for the types of things that they could apply their skills and their 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 toolkit to. It, the data doesn't exist. And that's where we'll discuss a little bit later with blockchain, how you can create the data. Yes, yeah, so that's an excellent point. So, and it seems that blockchain technology uh, can help us enable this uh, greater efficiency, transparency, and security across every industry, across NGI, I would say nations, it's government industries, organizations, and academia. So uh, is it possible to integrate this risk modeling with distributed ledger technology for infrastructure obsolescence and maintenance? Absolutely. And um, I, I let me explain the infrastructure model a little bit more. Um, and then I'll explain why it can be done on blockchain and why there may be many other things in throughout society that insurance can apply its skills to using blockchain technology. So the idea really behind uh, this mathematical theory that you've alluded to is that uh, all physical assets of all kinds that make up our world, that make up the, the things that consume our resources through its creation and through its uh, operation, um, they uh, they have a natural mortality and you can study that and uh, you can actually uh, synchronize the mortality in a mathematical way using the law of large numbers it's almost like playing blackjack now i know that many of our listeners maybe are not familiar with the game but uh, it's also called 21 so if you uh, the dealer gives you cards and the whole idea of blackjack is that you want to have a, a hand, in other words, a certain number of cards that add up in quantity that is less than 21, but greater than the hand that the dealer has. So you're always telling the dealer, imagine you're in Las Vegas, okay, and you're, you're sitting there and everything is nice and you just had dinner and you're playing blackjack for the first time. So you're, you're trying to decide, do I accept another card from the dealer? Because if I keep accepting cards, I'll go over 21. 
and I will lose. I will lose the money that I've betted. Yet if I stop too early, uh, the dealer will have perhaps a higher card. So it's a timing issue. It's the same thing with a gas turbine in a power plant. Do I replace it this year or do I hold on to it another year? Do I hold on to it another year after that? And if I go over 21, which is analogous to the machine breaking and causing a huge downtime, which costs me revenues, uh, or do I replace the equipment too early and then I'm replacing stuff too frequently, which is also very expensive. So pardon my chime there for my outlook. Okay. But the idea is basically that you can balance this on a portfolio level and uh, you can recover quantifiably a lot of a lot of money, basically a lot of wasted resources. Now, blockchain is important because none of this data that I just described to you to achieve this exists. It doesn't exist anywhere. And this kind of ties back to your earlier question: How could insurance contribute uh, at this level of risk management? Well, they can't today because this data doesn't exist. There's nothing for actuaries to apply their skills to. But you can incentivize the creation of data by using actually tokens and cryptocurrency native to the blockchain application. If somebody participates in a game like blackjack, for example, they're actually creating the very data that you need to play this blackjack game on a very large scale. And every time they participate, they are awarded tokens and the participation creates value in this this it's almost like a market. They're actually doing something which creates value for society and the token through free market economics and forward pricing actually begins to assume the value of this activity that they're doing. So they are creating data and they're applying actuarial and engineering analysis to the data at the same time, creating this value. So it's a little bit of a complicated subject because it's actually, it's insurance math, what I'm describing. And a lot of people don't feel comfortable with that. And they'd rather not remember their high school algebra. But the thing is that the blockchain can incentivize the creation of data to which you can apply big data analytics for the very first time. So what will you say is the underlying hypothesis for this blockchain-based insurance model that uh, you are uh, proposing? The underlying hypothesis is that machines uh, use energy in their creation and they also use energy in their operation. And you want to minimize and balance the sum of those. If you let them run too long, their running expenses increase too high and the sum is much, much higher. If you replace them too frequently, the capital cost of constantly replacing them becomes too high and the sum is much higher. If you can balance them, there's sort of like a, I wish I could show it to you, it's kind of like a smiley face with a minimum. And by balancing them on a portfolio level, like an insurance product, you're actually at the minimum of the sum of the capital versus operating expenses. And that is a matter of trillions of dollars a year. People don't believe it because they've never seen the data, but the theory is very simple to describe on paper. Now oh, that seems very, very interesting. So what, what role do you see of actuary here? Of the actuaries, well, actuaries can participate in this game. It could be an insurance product if insurance companies were interested in trying to establish this as a commercial um, uh, like a surplus surplus lines type product. Uh, but the thing is, we still need to educate people, owners of infrastructure, especially that they are facing this value proposition. Again, it's the short term, short termism that lets people, that prevents people from seeing far enough to, to really see why this matters. Uh, but the, the savings would be immediate, especially through blockchain. Remember we were talking about tokens, the tokens, actually behave like a kind of equity. They would sort of, uh, they would present value the, the future value of all of these savings that are coming. It's basically what's called, uh, it's known as forward pricing. So you look at the token, it behaves kind of like an equity. And uh, this is possible, especially through security tokens. And you're expecting the monetization of these future recoveries of uh, energy, labor, and materials. So once you have this, um, this token is doing this, you've got the actuaries and engineers working together to determine when is the appropriate time to replace a major asset in order to get that optimum synchronization that we were just talking about. And their work is of value to someone, especially a, a power utility that has a very large portfolio of capital assets. 
Um, I'm thinking of Nextera Energy, which owns most of the old power companies on the East Coast. Uh, they have something like $25 billion in, uh, in physical assets. And I believe that's a replacement value. No, it's much more than that. I have to look back. It may be as high as 60 billion, but it's, it's a big, big number. Um, transportation authorities, municipalities, and a lot of these companies also own very similar homogeneous kinds of assets, which is just great for insurance when you want to group similar assets together for this, this aggregate uh, numbers analysis. Uh, municipalities all have almost the same kind of equipment, police cars, fire engines, water treatment plants, which are all you know, identical types of equipment. You can group them together and articulate big data for the first time, new big data that hasn't existed before. Yes, yes. Not uh, now, now, since, since this is too many, too many. Oh, oh, you broke up a little bit there. Yeah. So since resources to manufacture and operate physical assets seems to be very scarce, and but they scarce, not scarce, seems to be very scarce, and they represent the vast proportion of all materials and energy consumed by society. Do you think that this life cycle cost of aging infrastructure can be minimized if this obsolescence is handled as an insurance insurable event? You talked about, you know, how we, we will be able to save money. And uh, do you think this uh, whole uh, life cycle cost also can be minimized? Absolutely. And I mean, that's the theme of the whole technology. And it's a technology that's difficult to imagine when somebody first explain something, there's only a handful of people who understand it at first. And then it may take a few years and people begin to read some white paper that you wrote. And I'm confident that it's it's going to happen soon. I mean, I've got at least, uh, let's see, I, I think uh, there are about five people in the world right now who completely understand the idea. And I think you're one of them. So uh, I'm optimistic that people will begin to understand that the math is very straightforward. It's just not in our consciousness like Bitcoin is these days, because people really haven't seen the results of it yet. It hasn't really hit anyone's consciousness. But I'm one of these uh, these theorizers, and uh, the, the theory that I've created is actually very straightforward. It uses very rudimentary financial mathematics to prove the concept itself. We just don't have the data yet. Blockchain is going to be the enabler of this concept. And I'm optimistic that there are other things, too, that blockchain will be able to do that are similar to this. Again, it's the articulation of big data across infrastructure using a risk management approach that actuaries have developed over the last century. Absolutely. I, I, we all hope for that. Now, uh, we talked earlier about how uh, there are you know, no standards or no guidelines or there is uh, no authority who is uh, defining that okay this much is uh, going to be the life of any physical asset or any infrastructure so in a nation across any nation who is responsible for uh, replacement of aging physical assets or even maintaining those assets who decides how it, and how it is decided that the life of any physical asset is over and that uh, how are decisions taken whether an asset should be replaced or uh, repaired and how will you structure something like this on uh, uh, the model that you are proposing where how would it be determined whether at what time the asset should be replaced or repaired and who will take that decision well, it's, um, I think it's a big question you just asked, because I, I think that and I'll try to answer it as succinctly as I can. Uh, today, um, assets are replaced uh, when they really present uh, a headache, when the cost of keeping them, the opportunity cost of keeping the old uh, asset simply becomes so great that it's so obvious that it's time to replace it. Um, payback period. So somebody would like to see a payback period as short as possible to replace something. So it looks like a very intelligent decision. There are, of course, safety concerns, which will override everything we're talking about right now. If a piece of equipment is a safety hazard, people have enough common sense, usually, most of the time to replace it. Um, you won't see, as I gave an example before, an airliner with cracks in the wings. It's going to be taken out of service and parked somewhere near to Tucson as quickly as possible. Um, but for the most part, people do try to defer the replacement of assets beyond an optimal time. It just makes short-term financial sense to keep uh, 
something running as long as possible. And it may not be defective in a maintenance uh, sense. It may simply be obsolete in that another technology out there exists that uses less energy to achieve the same work, that uses less labor to achieve the same result, and less consumable materials to do the same. Technology is constantly evolving. Isn't there any matter? Isn't there any matter to calculate the value, threshold value at which any infrastructure asset should be replaced or repaired? There is no uh, formula involved here? No, there are guidelines. There are useful, there are best practices and guidelines. Uh, but again, a lot of times the guidelines are as simple as it has to have better than a five-year payback period or something, some kind of a company guideline. Of, and that's a very common one, actually. Uh, people for more complex assets, they will do net present value analysis, discounted cash flow to try to show, try to make arguments for when to replace something. But none of these things are done at a portfolio level. And in fact, it is a portfolio problem. That's part of my mathematical proof to show that it is in fact a portfolio problem using information from other similar assets that are grouped together in, in homogeneous classifications. Um, it's not just from information coming from the asset by itself. It's actually, it's, it's an industry-wide data application. Uh, just like human life, you do need to aggregate similar assets together to really see how, you know, how, um, you know, what the mortality is. And machines are no exception. So there is a, there's an optimization problem that happens at a portfolio level, which is, which is not really being considered at this point. Every company is working like a silo by itself, working with its limited information that it has, justifying it with ad hoc spreadsheets and discounted cash flow analysis. And uh, you know, it's, so it becomes sort of a financial, an ad hoc financial exercise, which mostly takes into account other things outside uh, uh, environmental impacts. When I say environmental, I mean exogenous impacts of other technology, new technology creating opportunity costs uh, because there's more efficient, better technology out there to do the job. So equipment, machines, physical assets can become obsolete, and it's usually not a maintenance issue at all. It's an issue of becoming technologically obsolete. And then there's this idea that, you know, we don't have the money this year, let's wait till next year. Oh, we don't have it this year, let's wait again. And the blockchain idea is very interesting because the way you would... Um, determine the timing, the correct timing on this portfolio level is also accompanied by a release of funds. It's like an insurance product. It actually is literally an insurance product and you release funds for the replacement of these major physical assets. And that release happens because of an adjudication contest. You have, you have engineers on one side and you have actuaries on the other side. And you maybe have a dozen engineers and a dozen actuaries and the engineers are all competing to estimate uh, the opportunity costs of not replacing the old gas turbine. And then you have the actuaries using their discipline to analyze the open data on the blockchain to decide what is the correct uh, threshold. And the winner on both sides is the engineer who comes closest to the median value. He earns, I don't know, 10 bitcoins. And then the actuary who comes closest to her value, she earns 10 bitcoins. So they're compensated. They're they're it's like almost a competitive sort of adjudication like bidding that leads them to closer and closer more and more accurate estimates based on physics and math and if the accurate if the actuary's estimate is lower than the engineer's estimate even by a slight amount the smart contract will automatically release the three million dollars in bitcoin or in quant or whatever your your uh, currency is going to be in mass and you've paid for the asset. You actually have a, a self-insurance mechanism that uses distributed adjudicators uh, that are not even affiliated with the owner of the asset. They are independent. They are double-blind, peer-reviewed. They're anonymous to each other. They're competing with each other to establish a physical fact based on an actuarial, actuarial theory. And this action also creates the data that the actuaries use later on the, the transaction creates the data itself that becomes part of the analysis and the records, uh, like an insurance product. No, I, I, I think that's uh, excellent uh, uh, information you provided there. But what you told about the business is operating in silo, taking decisions in silo, that is a cause of concern because uh, everything is interconnected. And if one, as, uh, one business takes a decision in silo about you know, replacing or repairing their asset, uh, without uh, any of the all the other you know 
connected, interconnected parties are not taken into consideration or are not involved in the decision making process, then we do see some uh, risk emerging from that. But how do decision makers make a decision whether to replace only one asset isolated from the whole fleet or, you know, to replace the whole fleet? How, how can they take decisions if they are taking decisions in silo? How can they take decisions whether the whole infrastructure, the whole system that is interconnected needs to be replaced or repaired or whether only certain fragment or uh, only certain asset needs to be replaced or repaired? So how do they make that decision? Yeah, well, I think that, that they are making a decision, as we described before, in a silo. And I think this is where the error comes from. And this is, again, where we could learn a lot about risk management, particularly from the insurance industry. Um, infrastructure is, by some estimates, an $8 trillion a year industry. And that doesn't even include, that's mostly new construction. That doesn't even include all the energy, time, and materials that all of these existing infrastructure actually consumes. So um, it's, it's, you take the largest company within infrastructure industry, it, take Bechtel, for example, I'm not sure if it's the largest, but it's one of the largest. It has about $28 billion a year in, in revenues. That's less than half a percent of its industry. So take Google, which spans about 80% of its industry. They can articulate big data and look at the entire fleet, as you said. They can look at the entire picture. We can't in infrastructure. We are so siloed into fragmented uh, segments and in, into small companies. It's, it's hard imagining calling Bechtel a small company, but 28 billion out of 8 trillion is truly nothing. So insurance is kind of the same. In fact, insurance is even more fragmented, but they've solved the problem by creating third parties that actually aggregate statistical data to share by everyone. So if we can imitate that a little bit, we don't have to follow their history exactly, but I think infrastructure can jump straight into blockchain to articulate big data cross-sectionally and across the entire industry, uh, and at the same time, create these, adjud these independent adjudication forces to do engineering, to do uh, actuarial work, let the actuaries help us with our engineering in a disintermediated, uh, distributed way. And um, I, I personally believe that the applications are out there and there are many. This articulation of big data is sort of an umbrella use case within infrastructure and for blockchain, where you take risk management principles and, and use them for the first time. Absolutely. So what value do you see blockchain application provide in this decision making process? How will it be effective for infrastructure delivery method? Yeah, I think that uh, for one, the, the use of a disintermediated uh, force of adjudicators is important because you have people who are not associated, not affiliated with each other. And sometimes that third party neutrality is important um, in, in creating uh, uh, professional opinions of, of things, especially estimates, numerical estimates. Um, it, I think the whole industry could benefit from, from an independent, distributed, disintermediated uh, workforce that, uh, that, that, that would be organized in this way. But also it's the way that the distribution itself is what creates sort of a cross-sectional exposure across the entire industry that would create, again, this articulation of big data. Um, so that's that's one of the big reasons why I think blockchain is important. And then there's just the whole factor of monetization using tokens of this new value. Uh, these engineers will be doing things, and actuaries working together, will be doing things that have never been done by anyone before. They'll be monetizing time and value that has never been monetized before. Yes. So talking so, about monetization, how would the blockchain based approach help fund activities such as design or construction or operation or maintenance of this infrastructure? Right. I think that maintenance and replacement especially has a model for funding through blockchain. If you create a ledger of things in our infrastructure, um, and when I say things, take a water treatment plant, there are at least 200 major things in a water treatment plant that could be put on a ledger of things, on an immutable blockchain ledger. And there are so many things you could do with that information that is pretty much permanent and it's immutable as long as there's an incentive to maintain and keep this blockchain. But the, the infrastructure obsolescence game, the obsolescence insurance product 
that I was describing before, which is kind of an open source uh, type of product that doesn't really belong to any one person or a party or, or business. It could actually create the value that would uh, be monetizable in the tokens because the value that the activity, this kind of work that they are performing, which has never been done before, is valuable to someone like Nextera Energy, that uh, the big power utility I was talking about. They will actually buy tokens in order to fund the continuation of this kind of work. And they have to bid up and buy up the value of this token. Now, if you have preceded all of this ledger of things with these tokens, with the mass token, for example, that the Integrated Engineering Blockchain Consortium is talking about, if you seed the, uh, uh, the, the entire ledger of things with these tokens, they can actually uh, uh, eventually monetize the value of the activity that the engineers and actuaries are doing together. They're creating real value that can then be used to fund today's infrastructure needs and tapping into a totally un, unused resource, which is tomorrow's uh, recovered savings in energy labor materials that have been present valued, again, through forward-looking fundamentals, uh, just like for a, a security, like a stock or bond. Yes, absolutely. Now, irrespective of public or private, what benefits will infrastructure owners get from this blockchain-based model? Well, um, I think there are, um, besides the risk management benefits, there are a lot of other ancillary benefits, I think, that uh, simply by having a, a disintermediated, distributed workforce that uh, can adjudicate smart contracts, I think you also have a lot of engineering talent, actuarial talent, scientific talent. You have a lot of legal talent, people who have built this together. And uh, they will be out there and they will be public and maybe semi-anonymous. A lot of people use usernames for these kinds of uh, applications that you don't know really who they are, but they can always be contacted and their reputation is indelibly tied to the things that they've said, uh, the claims that they've made and the claims that have been validated by other people whose reputations are become digital basically. So it leaves an indelible, immutable record of a person's reputation. We all have reputations, but they can be destroyed simply by a single piece of misinformation uh, in you know overnight. But uh, on a blockchain, at least there is a, a building of reputation that's comprised of academic credentials, uh, actual published work, actual activity that you've done in curating the, the content of other, other people's work. And um, so I think that by having such a community, the community itself constitutes a very complex body of knowledge that could be used for, uh, for just about anything besides this obsolescence insurance use case that I was describing. Right. Now, the approach to handling obsolescence as an insurable event, how is that compared to an insurance company or captive created for this purpose? I mean, you talked about it, that it helps minimize cost if the approach is to handle it as an insurable event. But how is the broader industry benefiting, you know, the approach that you are taking over the uh, approach that has been taken over the years? Yeah, well, we have um, we have looked. It's curious that you mentioned captives. Uh, we actually have explored this uh, with Marsh a few years ago. Jacobs has, and um, it's it's very difficult to to create an insurance product around an idea like obsolescence insurance, mostly because it doesn't really fit the definition of uh, fortuity that you would expect in an insurance uh, an insurable event. Uh, equipment. Uh, machines, physical assets, uh, they will become obsolete. At least that's the opinion right now that many people have. I can show mathematically as an expert witness if someone asked me that in fact, uh, the mortality of physical assets is fortuitous and uh, what the IRS refers to as aleatory. So it should qualify as an insurable thing. In fact, it is more random and fortuitous and aleatory even than and human life and we certainly have life insurance so why shouldn't we have a product for to address the mortality of our physical assets but um we find there'd be too much resistance really to uh to try to pursue that path and the other thing too is that when you aggregate everything together um you're you're really the insured the party who wishes to be insured is not just the 
one owner to one asset. It's a company that has a whole portfolio of assets. And once you have a whole portfolio of assets, it's true, maybe it's no longer as fortuitous, although you could look at it like a group life insurance policy. Or, you know, so I'm getting a little bit technical in the insurance language there, but um, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's too difficult because there are many overhead costs associated with the commercial insurance product as well. Blockchain is autonomous. It's not a company at all. And um, all of these people working together are being rewarded by tokens that monetize the work, the value that they are creating. But uh, the overhead that's normally associated uh, with an insurance company and plus the regulation, the capital, the initial capital requirements, capitalization to start a captive entity are just huge barriers to, to having something like that actually happen. So this is why blockchain is so exciting because it's almost like you're building an autonomous insurance company that's not a company at all that really has no employees it's distributed and it actually creates its own data and it should allow actuaries to begin to theorize about what else is there out there in society that we can apply our law of large numbers to to extract all this value from and i think we're not there yet but slowly we will get there yes i understand this so it seems that blockchain technology could allow the development of an autonomous organization with the essential functionality of an insurance product, but without the you know usual corporate expenses and all those third-party insurance uh, company and all the, all the other costs involved. So on this blockchain platform that uh, you are proposing, who will identify repair and replacement uh, of the risk exposure? Okay, that's, uh, that's a very easy question. Um, so we're talking about creating a ledger of things um, as well as sort of a ledger of people too that would be matched with the things to make you know, informed decisions about the, the obsolescence of our vast inventory of physical assets in the world. Um, so the, the ledger of things would be, uh, the things would be owned by someone. So if someone wanted to uh, uh, decide, okay, th this gas turbine, I don't know, it's been with us for 22 years and uh, we had a, a problem with it last year and it wasn't, I w we couldn't turn it on when uh, it got very hot uh, in, in Southern California. I'm just using an example and they, they use gas turbines often to, to handle peak loads when everyone's turning their air conditioners on at the same time. So there was a cost associated with that. So the owner of that, uh, uh, P and G probably would decide what are we going to do with this gas turbine? Maybe we should see if we have to replace it. So they simply go to the smart contract that defines their uh, asset and that actually has cryptocurrency in it, which is an asset that backs up the mortality of this gas turbine. And then they, uh, they simply make a call for adjudication. And I'm not exactly sure how it would go out into the blockchain, but uh, panels of engineers and panels of actuaries would be randomly selected, uh, although they would be, their random selection would be weighted probably according to reputation. And then they go into this uh, form of competition that I was describing earlier to create accurate estimates of, on one hand, the opportunity costs of not replacing the gas turbine. And then on the other hand, what is the current best threshold of that opportunity cost at which to replace the asset. And again, if the engineer's estimate has it shows to be higher than the actuary's estimate, the smart contract releases the funds, uh, the cryptocurrency funds that will be used to replace the asset. And those cryptocurrency funds could have been seeded in this ledger of things maybe 10 years before. And uh, the interesting thing is if at that time the cryptocurrency was not worth much because it was a nascent business idea that hadn't yet fully monetized the value, um, it may be worth something now. So it's a way of creating value through participation that can actually be used to fund infrastructure needs in, in the near future. So since blockchain applications and virtual currencies are going to be connected, how will this be integrated with the insurance model for managing infrastructure uh, risk? Because if, are we talking about uh, the tokens that uh, will be created for this platform? Uh, only those will be uh, the entities, uh, participating entities will be able to use or they will be able to use any virtual currencies. I mean, uh, right now there will be tokens that you on this platform that will be issued. Now there are also Bitcoin available. All the uh, several countries are issuing their own currencies. Uh, 
there are a lot of banks also in the process of issuing their own currency so which currency will be uh, accepted is it going to be just one or is it going to be all you know pool of currencies that will be accepted and how will it work you know this could be a whole separate area of risk management and the uh, the cryptocurrency world is so complex and i'm by no means an expert i'm i'm kind of a bystander watching what's going on um and it, you know the, the the good thing is that uh, you can convert between cryptocurrencies and fiat currency and that's you know that how you manage the risk uh, the exchange rate risk between currencies and, and stay on top of all the developments that are going on um, there were hearings in congress just two weeks ago uh, which seemed to show that uh, uh, utility tokens will probably be, for the most part, defined as security tokens in the near future. And then there are certain tokens that probably will not have to be considered security tokens. And it just there's so much going on right now. The, the SEC has stepped in and shut down several fraudulent um, ICOs. And there's so much going on that uh, um, it, it's tough to know what happens with the, the stability of cryptocurrencies, any tokens that we would use to incentivize participation uh, and use to fund infrastructure in the future. Uh, You're right, and that, that would need to be sorted out because, you know, for any, any platform, which uh, token or which uh, cryptocurrency is going to be accepted or how it's going to be accepted, that those all uh, features will need to be uh, decided and defined. So now how would the physical infrastructure assets be registered in the blockchain? There, there is going to be so many assets, you know, it, it, they could be in uh, cyberspace, they could be in geospace, they could be in space also, depending on which system we are talking about. Now, uh, are you planning to use different kind of IoT sensors? And what kind of uh, sensors would be used? And how would all these parts of the assets be differentiated and cataloged? What is What are your... What is the process or what you are defining? Well, IoT is interesting, and I think it, it doesn't necessarily have application in the specific use case that we've just been talking about, although it could, but I haven't really figured out how to integrate it in yet. It, it's mostly uh, human data generated by a human brain using basic familiarity with, with natural laws and uh, actuarial principles. So there, IoT... I, really, I enough as you go forward i think thomas that would not be enough you would need to integrate iot sensor data with uh, the system that uh, is oh yes no i mean i agree that there is a place for iot and uh, not only that but even you could integrate a let once you've created a ledger of things i think this is what you're getting at why stop at obsolescence insurance why not create really a ledger of things why not make it a full building information management, a BIM type system that records data on of all kinds on assets. Once an, a an asset has an address on a blockchain, why not use that address to fully inform, uh, create a fully transparent, fully informed data structure on that one asset? And IoT certainly will fall into that. I mean, a big use that I see of blockchain and assets too is simply to prevent the impairment of the value of existing assets. Um, last month in New Mexico, we wanted to replace this large industrial dryer. And there is a piece inside the dryer called an auger screw. And it may have been completely rusted. And we wanted to just replace that, but the manufacturer of the dryer went bankrupt. They no longer existed. And the manufacturing drawings no longer existed. So we had no idea what this auger screw was supposed to look like. So we were faced with a very real possibility of having to replace the entire $3 million dryer just because we didn't know what this one piece would, how it had to be built. So the, and the same thing with buildings. I mean, records on asbestos removal that may have occurred decades in the past really may not be accurate or no longer exist. So the, the value of the building has been impaired and that may lead to a premature demolition that was not necessary. Yeah, and so see, in those circumstances, now you know if that data is available on blockchain, it yes. would never be destroyed and it would be available for this kind of situation. Yes, yeah, I mean, and it's the same with um, the time horizon thing we were talking about. There is no central system, no central repository of data on, that is compatible with legacy infrastructure because legacy infrastructure has risks and things associated with them that stretch out multiple decades. And, and we were really too short term in our business thinking and in our record keeping 
Um, we have lots of software at Jacobs. We use SharePoint a lot. We use ProjectWise. We use um, OneDrive. Lots of these software products, they're great for organizing around a project today. But how many times have the records been migrated somewhere else or been deleted by someone only a year or two after the project was over? Um, you know, I used to work with a manufacturer that uh, kept microfilm records going back to the 1920s. And it was great. Whenever we had to fabricate a spare part for someone, we could just look it up and fabricate it. But if a fire or a flood were to destroy that microfilm, which could easily happen, you've just impaired billions of dollars of these, just from this one company, the, the, what they've manufactured over the last 50 years, impaired in a very real way. But we just don't think about that risk because we've never been able to really do anything about it. And a ledger of things, uh, that has the immutable records that creates all this value that will probably exist forever or could be incorporated to more successful sibling ventures. Uh, it, it's There's a real place for that in risk management around infrastructure. Yes, very true. I mean, it's not just the infrastructure. Even if you look in the scientific world or, you know, any other uh, industry, uh, this is the same problem, intellectual property, so much knowledge is being created, generated, so much new ideas, new innovations, new intellectual property is being uh, uh, created. But uh, if if it's not going to be of use, it just gets destroyed and, you know, nobody, it gets lost. Nobody knows what kind of developments are happening across nations, what kind of ideas or innovations are emerging. There is no central repository, not even at the local or national level. So a lot of uh, ideas, innovations, intellectual property, they are just getting destroyed. And that is a shame that we have to reinvent everything, you know, every time an organization needs uh, uh, something. If we save all those ideas, innovations, uh, processes and everything that has been defined and uh, then, you know, we would not have to waste so much resources on so many different projects. And uh, I hope that, you know, with this blockchain uh, based digital in, uh, system uh, that we are developing, that we will be able to save all that different kind of uh, ideas into, and uh, processes and technology and intellectual property. So now let's go back to the talking about uh, how the, on the proposed uh, model, how will the release of funds for repair or replacement would be defined and governed? Well, the, the, the governance of that is pretty much up to these, uh, these uh, panels of engineers and actuaries, these third party, uh, disintermediated, distributed, um, what's another word I could use to describe them? Uh, they, they, they compete with each other, much as, um, and, and let me provide another analogy to, to what's going on here. Uh, I think most people are familiar a little bit familiar with how Bitcoin works, Bitcoin mining, proof of work mining. It's the idea that uh, it's, it's a trivial mathematical puzzle. You are just trying to find a very large number, a random number. And most of the time people employ computers, computing resources, just to count up from zero until they, they find the number. They're in a race. It's a useless activity. Why is why are people doing this? Three Russian scientists were arrested last week because they borrowed a government computer to do this. And there's so much, so, so much zeal, so much interest in mining Bitcoin because it has become very expensive. Um, the energy that's being wasted and the amount of brain power people are employing artificial intelligence and machine learning to find this this arbitrary number. And um, I think we're using as much energy as the country of Portugal right now, something like 50 terawatts of energy every year, ter terawatt hours of energy every year. Um, imagine if you could use, if you could harness all of that mining zeal into doing some useful work that comes from a human brain instead of just counting from zero up to some very high random number. Imagine if people were actually competing using education using, for example, an engineering education or a statistics education to actually do something that uh, that creates value. So to come back to your first question, who's actually doing the adjudication? So these panels would be doing it. They're actually doing this kind of human proof of brain mining work, actually providing useful uh, human work that's beneficial to society. And there are many ways that you can harness the human brain around these, these consensus protocols that um, 
are not being used to mine blocks, really. They're actually separate from what's called node maintenance, uh, but to perform useful work in exchange for tokens. So Bitcoin proved that people would become very passionate about actually working very hard for currency. And you can you can't structure and organize human work around that principle. Yes, no, that, that's an excellent point. Now, uh, my concern is that when we, I mean, there will be need for using the cryptocurrency. It doesn't matter which cryptocurrency, uh, in which format, from uh, what nation, where is it originating, but the, there will be need for using cryptocurrency, some kind of token. Now, since most of the currency would be locked in an illiquid form uh, as contractually held funds for future claims generated by the aging of physical assets, how would the stability of currency be achieved? Because there is so much fluctuation right. in the uh, cryptocurrency market. So how would uh, that be determined? That is the that is the twenty trillion dollar question. Yeah. If somebody can find a cryptocurrency that will be stable, that will be the cryptocurrency that everyone will adopt and that could possibly replace everything else. But that's the major weakness of cryptocurrencies right now. Because we are trying to tie it to the uh, insurance, aging infrastructure. That's why we need to come up with a strategy of how are we going to uh, make sure that uh, it is stable. Because otherwise, uh, you know, how would the insurance premiums uh, will be defined? You know, how are we going to go forward on that? Yes. The cryptocurrency market uh, as such, you know, separately is different. But when we are tying it with the aging infrastructure repair or replacement, it's an entirely different uh, process that we have to come up with. Yes. And I think this is where actuarial science actually comes in. If you have a token that has true fundamentals for valuation, and I wish I had my uh, securities valuation textbook, the one by by Graham Dodd that uh, everyone uses in the finance industry. If you had something equivalent to that um, for a token, something that you could actually go on the blockchain and with the open data structure, you can actually analyze and say, okay, this activity is worth $12 trillion a year and there are 200 trillion of this token. That provides you with like almost like a discounted cash flow analysis equation right there that actually tells you how much each token really is worth in in intrinsic terms intrinsic terms generated by uh, again the data that's being created uh, which is already being translated into dollar terms by the engineers and the actuaries but it's really the savings in energy labor materials that you can actually project with this activity and then if you can actually put a dollar value to that, which these panels of adjudicators are doing every day that they're participating, you would actually have intrinsic fundamentals for valuation of the token. And once you have that, the tokens will not swing wildly in all over the place. Because today, nobody knows. A lot of tokens are what they're called application tokens, that they are actually based on the Metcalf effect, this idea of network uh, creating value in some way. And that's fine. There's actually truth to that. But it's not a hard numerical way of actually calculating the value of a token or a stock or a bond. But if you actually have a protocol token that actually has an activity that's quantifiable and that actually has wealth being generated, like uh, like a stock, for example, an equity in a company, then you have fundamental intrinsic valuation fundamentals that you can actually calculate how much a token should be worth. And at that point, even forward pricing becomes a matter of trying to decide how much more efficient the actuaries and how much more efficient the engineers are going to be over the next 10 years. But not, no more of this incredible volatility that we're seeing today, where nobody has any idea what cryptocurrency really should be worth. It's all based no, on. I think, I think some organizations have come up uh, with a way of backing the cryptocurrency with actual physical gold. So maybe that could be, you know, also taken into consideration to come up uh, uh, with all these financial securities to be backed. I mean, the, whichever token you define, that it could be backed by some sort of physical collateral or, you know, physical gold, or, you know, maybe tied to the nation's currency, like, you know, you tied to the United States dollar. So there may be some way of financial stability could be achieved. Yes, actually, uh, we were just in a meeting this morning where we were discussing um, uh, steam-backed dollars. 
And they have for a very long time been pegged to the US dollar. So one steam back dollar is equal to one US dollar. Not today, actually. As of November, they just couldn't hold it anymore. And they actually have a monetary policy like a central bank. Um, so we are, you know, like Janet Yellen, we're raising and lowering the interest rate. Uh, and uh, they were able to keep it very close, a very close peg to the US dollar for a very long time. But then in November, they just couldn't keep it. And it went up as high as I think $12. And today it's $5 per steam back dollar. It's very hard to keep um, uh, a currency pegged to another currency or even a, a commodity. Um, and people can do it, but even countries have failed at it. So Argentina, a while back, tried to peg to the U.S. dollar. Uh, and I may be talking almost a decade ago, so I'm not aware of what they're doing today. But it's very difficult for some countries to stay pegged. I know that uh, I think the Jordanian dinar, I've been watching that for a while. I believe that was they were very successful in, in staying pegged to the U.S. dollar. Um, there are many ways you can try to peg something, but it still doesn't really have intrinsic worth. You're still playing with a monetary policy that that's bound to fail at some point, unless you're the United States or or the euro or the yen. And um, I think the trick really is to find a currency that has as close to true intrinsic value as possible to actually create some activity on a blockchain that has a quantifiable economic value that can't easily be disputed and that uh, uh, that the people who are creating the economic value uh, recognize in, in the tokens that they're receiving as payment. And I think once you link so closely, and this is the great thing about blockchain technology and especially engineering in blockchain technology, if you can link the intrinsic activity of engineering directly to the token that's being used to pay the engineers, I think you're coming very close to, to uh, at least that's the theory that we're operating with uh, in the IEBC, the Integrated Engineering Blockchain Consortium, um, to, to create a token with intrinsic stable value. No, that would be very essential. Uh, that, that is going to be the foundation of how to, you know, this whole system would uh, function. Now, there's another uh, aspect that uh, needs to be, I mean, needs to be discussed is the ownership of the risk. As the different risks are identified of the infrastructure, uh, uh, how will the ownership of a risk be transferred to the insurance? Because you are trying to make this as an insurable event. So how would the ownership of a risk be transferred to the insurance? Well, if we're talking obsolescence insurance again, that is a true self-insurance model. So the ownership that if risk is actually not being transferred to another party at all. It's simply being aggregated in a way that uh, a lot of big companies will aggregate their workers' compensation and their health insurance risks, um, like Jacobs does, for example, and will hire a third-party administrator, uh, which is usually an insurance company, but they're not providing us with risk transfer with insurance, just the third-party administration of our own self-insurance. Now here, um, I don't think there would be a third-party administrator, but but to broaden perhaps the intent of your question, uh, how would you actually have insurance on a blockchain to transfer risk? I, I don't think it's impossible. I think you could have, uh, it depends on how you pool the risks together and pool the, the premiums together. So if, the, if, if there's a pool of risk capital that is shared by multiple uh, parties wishing to transfer the risk, that's very possible to engineer within smart contracts. So you could have an autonomous insurance company that has um, uh, actuaries, that has uh, uh, underwriters uh, working, providing the actual work of insurance. Uh, but of course, you still run into regulation questions with which I'm not familiar. But I think the, as far as pooling the, the shared pool of risk capital, I don't see how that presents a problem at all using smart contract technology. Yes, because I think uh, apart from insurance, we, there will also be a need to tie the compliance aspect to the, uh, the model that uh, right. is being developed. Now, each system needs, needs audit. And do you think that this uh, blockchain-based insurance model risk management system will be a perfectly auditable system? You know, I think that as far as uh, it, it's interesting, where does the need for auditing come from? I know that there are certain insurance products which are far less regulated than others. I think the surplus lines type products are not regulated the way uh, workers' comp would be, for example. So um, 
I, I'm really not, uh, I'm not knowledgeable in the, the compliance and the regulatory aspects of insurance uh, and how they would translate to blockchain. I think that if you've created something totally new that even came from with, you know, without the insurance industry, uh, such as the idea of obsolescence insurance, something which harnesses the power of the law of large numbers is not necessarily uh, a subject of regulation. Um, especially if it's self-insurance. Uh, but that's an interesting question. Yes, but regulation, Thomas, we know that it's always going to remain. Sure. The sure. role is always going to be there. We will not be able to eliminate that. So we will need to figure out how to integrate the compliance aspect to it, how to integrate the audit aspect to it, because these all yeah. functions are going to survive even in this digital global age? Well, it's, it's still an interesting question. And I, I'm not totally sure that, uh, again, using something that's like insurance, but may not be considered, uh, supply chain management could be thought of as insurance, but it doesn't fall into the regulator's purview. Uh, but yes, any other kind of product that, uh, that might be construed as insurance or that actually tries to, like crop insurance, for example. I mean, it's a very common example on blockchain that if uh, a farmer has a smart contract, that uh, connects him to a shared uh, pool of risk capital. And if a, uh, on the internet there's information that his geocode corresponded to a temperature drop below freezing and uh, the contract deems that that will have caused damage, a uh, predetermined amount of damage to his crops, and then the funds are released through smart contract to the farmer. That sounds like a traditional area of, uh, uh, of insurance. And that is something that you're right, might be subject to regulation, even if it is on a blockchain. And in that case, I would say certainly the data is there. But then the question too is, who does this insurance company even belong to? <laughs> so I, again- That's a bigger question, you're right, that who does yeah. it belong to? So Thomas, you know, there are so many uh, different aspects that I would still love to talk about, like smart contracts and uh, the processes and how the whole system would look like and uh, what would it require, what kind of uh, uh, systems, collaboration it would require, uh, but, we have only one hour and I think we have passed one hour. So let's uh, conclude the discussion here. What would you like to uh, tell our global viewers and listeners about your efforts towards developing this blockchain based insurance model for managing the aging infrastructure uh, risk? Well, I'd, I'd like to just, first of all, thank you very much, Jayshree, for this opportunity to speak to your audience. And um, I'd like to let the world know basically that blockchain technology is, uh, is going to enable many new risk management approaches in infrastructure that will, I think, above all, extract value and efficiency beyond anything that uh, people can imagine. I think that we're looking at uh, a form of supply chain management, not just of penny ante uh, reduction of inventories of consumable goods, but we're looking at something that will integrate uh, manufacturers, owners of infrastructure, and uh, engineering firms, engineering construction firms, for the first time in a way that they have never been integrated before. And I believe that the world's largest engineering firm in the next three to five years will not be a company at all. It won't even have employees. And I think they will be doing stuff that we can't even imagine today and generating value that has never existed before. Yes, very true, very true. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to discuss all these on uh, the other episodes of Risk Rounder because there's so much to discuss about supply chain and manufacturing and uh, all different uh, stakeholders. How would that be integrated onto this blockchain model? So thank you so much, Thomas, for participating in Risk Rounder today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on blockchain-based insurance model for managing the aging infrastructure risk and our global viewers and listeners would benefit tremendously from the understanding you provided on the need for application of blockchain fundamentals for insurance model of aging infrastructure risk. So even if a single individual or entity is able to come up with ideas to support, collaborate and advance this much needed discussion around the aging infrastructure security based on the understanding they receive from this discussion we had today, this risk roundup dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. Thank you, Jay Shree. Wonderful. So while the idea and potential for blockchain-based insurance model for managing aging infrastructure risk ecosystem has a real value and promise, 
The fact remains that none of the above potential will be reached without cooperation and collaboration from everyone. Risk groups, integrated cybersecurity, geosecurity, and space security risk research centers are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIO and CGS, that means nations, its government industries, organizations, and academia in cyberspace, geospace, and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace, they all work together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts fit into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if we build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risks together. For more information on the Risk Roundups, to watch the Risk Roundup videos or hear the Risk Roundup audio podcast, please go to riskgroupalacy.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashree, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.